My name is Mark Millsap, and I uh, am really excited about being here. I cannot believe on a beautiful Saturday afternoon, I'm looking at all these uh, really bright young people that are our future, and there's a basketball game about 200 yards that direction. That's, that's impressive that you're here. Um, I, I had asked uh, Matt, I don't know if everybody received an email with, with uh, my slides, but I intentionally wanted those to go out early because there's some hyperlinks in there uh, that I think are kind of the meat, a uh, big part of the, the presentation, some things. So uh, hopefully if you didn't get an email, uh, why don't you check with Matt and he can get those to you later. But um, hopefully you have those. Um, I, um, as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, I was thinking about you, you students, you're, you're the brightest students and uh, the best that your respective institutions have to offer. And you've got great academic training, you've got great professors, you've got great resources that are offered to you. And what I thought I would do is something a little bit different in that you all have gotten a lot of, ac of the academics of, of investing. And what I'm going to do today is talk a little more about the practical side, the experience that all this gray hair didn't come from for nothing. Uh, 33 years of experience as a value investor. Now, I know those from University of Alabama know all about value investing. That's what they're being trained in. Culver House Investment Management Group is very much focused on value investing. Uh, those from other institutions may not be as familiar. Uh, I'm going to jump into that a little bit, but uh, that's what our firm does. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our firm in a minute. Um, the thing that I think is important, and you can see the, uh, the topic today, let's see here. All right, Matt. If you hit that center button, it'll light up green. Matt. Can I hit an arrow key? Yeah, you, you that. Okay, just, just that? that here, just yeah. that left button? Okay. You can see the title is Value Investing Through the Inevitable Periods of Underperformance. That sounds pretty boring, doesn't it? Uh, nobody likes to talk about underperformance. But what I thought I would do is kind of highlight that regardless of your investment philosophy, if you're in this business for any period of time, you're going to go through periods of underperformance. Everybody does. Uh, people are now talking about Warren Buffett. Uh, going through periods of underperformance now. They were talking about it in the late 90s. Uh, probably the preeminent value investor on the face of the, of the earth. And uh, these things are going to happen. And so I, what I want to try to do is try to recreate uh, that experience. Because it's interesting, our firm is going through one of those right now. You'll see in a minute. Uh, but um, what I want to do is, is uh, start out by telling you a little bit about why, one of the uh, motivations for me to be here today, and it's a little story that I experienced, and I, I've told Matt this, I think, and Shane Underwood this, but it, it's, you know, you go through life and you have experiences, some good experiences, some bad experiences, and you learn from all those. And when I was uh, 26 years old, a lot closer to your age than my age today, um, I was working in Birmingham, Alabama, in the trust investment department of what was then AmSouth Bank. And um, I had an opportunity to go to New York um, uh, on an investment uh, trip to do research and meet uh, kind of the, the top people in the, in the investment field. And uh, about a month before I left, uh, in Barron's Magazine, I don't know if you all read Barron's, but it's a great resource. But in Barron's Magazine, there was an article about a man named Walter Schloss, who's not probably a household name to you all. Walter Schloss, and you're going to see his name in a little bit, is a giant in the field of value investing. And he's little known. He came out of Columbia, which so many value investors come out of Columbia. Uh, Buffett did. Uh, and they learned under Benjamin Graham and David Dodd. And that's, those are kind of the, the uh, pri premier uh, instructors in those days of value investors. They are the top of the food chain as far as value investors go. Well, I decided I was going to call Walter Schloss, and I'm going to be there in a month. And I just thought, well, heck, I'm just going to give him a call. Maybe, maybe I can uh, meet this man. Uh, and he was probably 
I'm going to say about 70 years old back then. Well, I called information, got the number, and lo and behold, he answered his phone, which was, I, was like, <laughs> I didn't expect that. And uh, so I had an opportunity. I said, Mr. Sloss, I kind of had it all probably written out at the time. I said, Mr. Sloss, my name is Mark Millsap. I work in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm a value investor. I'm going to be in New York in a month. And I wanted to see if I could learn from you. Would you be available for me to take you to lunch? And there was this long pause. And I, you know, I had enough time to think. And he goes, what's in it for me? That was his response. And, of course, that took me aback. And I said, well, Mr. Schloss, um, really, uh, other than a free lunch and uh, the opportunity to teach a young person that's very much interested in value investing, about value investing from one of the greatest investors, there's really nothing in it for you. And there was a long pause again. His response was, nah, I don't think I'm going to do that. Now, that was disappointing. Okay? I learned from that experience. And that's the reason why I'm here in this room talking to you all today. Because as you go through your careers, you have opportunities to come in contact with a lot of bright young people. And I never wanted to have that kind of attitude with the people that are the next generation of successful value investors. So that's, that's a big part of the motivation for me to be here. Um, I'm going to boil down my career. Uh, you're going to do, if you're in our business at all, you're going to spend a tremendous amount of time reading, doing research. Uh, you all know that, many of you do. But in 33 years, I'll boil down, I'll save you a lot of time. These are, to me, the three greatest articles that you could possibly read about value investing. Uh, I have hyperlinks here for those, and, and I don't, uh, what you'll see is the, the, the first one is the super investors of Graham and Dodsville. It was written in the mid-80s by Warren Buffett. And what he talked about was the fact that it wasn't just happenstance. That there were a group of seven, he named seven, but there were actually more than that, of highly successful value investors that came out of Columbia that were trained under Benjamin Graham. And it was not just random that these seven people had incredible track records as investors. Um, and it, it, this is a just a, was a revolutionary article when it came out. It was, it, 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 uh, as I said, came out in the mid-80s. Well, a couple of years, actually about a year later, the second article came out as a follow-up to that first article. And it's our short-term performance and value investing mutually exclusive. And it's by a man named Eugene Shahan, who also was a Columbia University graduate, value investor his entire career. And what he did is he did research on... Uh, these seven individuals and firms. Walter Schloss was one of these people. You had Buffett, you had Walter Schloss, uh, you had Tweedy Brown, which was a firm, value investment firm. There were a number of highly successful value investors. And what he determined was that these are the all-stars. These are the Michael Jordans of value investing. And yet, as he did the research, he realized that virtually all of them underperformed the market. 30 to 40 percent of the time. So these are the all-stars and they're underperforming a third of the time. Now Buffett was actually a little bit better than that, but uh, quite a bit better actually, but the rest of them weren't. And they, these people had track records that you would die for, that you would love to have. So um, that was the second article that uh, I thought was really uh, formative to me in my young career, uh, like I said, in the late uh, 80s. The third article is written by a man named Robert Kirby, who was, I think he was chief investment officer of Capital Guardian, high, huge, highly successful West Coast firm. And he wrote an article called Hiring High and Firing Low. Uh, that sounds funny, doesn't it? Everybody think if you're a value investor, what do you try to do with the stock? Buy low and sell high, right? Well, he did, he, he wrote this article. It's a two-page article. You can read it in a minute and a half. And you've got a copy of it, by the way, in your slide, uh, in, in your hyperlink. But um, it, what this said was, and I'm going to read a little bit uh, of, the, of the final part of it, but he went through his entire career, and what he said was, generally investment managers are selected through what, what he called a beauty contest. You know, they have successful investors, but generally what he said is, I determined throughout my career, and he had a, probably a 40 or 50 year career when he wrote this, was that most institutional investors when they're hiring an investment manager want that long-term record 
successful record. But what they also want is a good short-term record. The last three years really dictated whether an investment manager got hired or not. So in essence, his argument was the people that were hiring investment managers were hiring high and firing low. They were doing the opposite of what a value investor should be doing. I'm going to read the last paragraph. If you have that uh, linked or anything, if you have that ability, read it. But the very last paragraph reads like this. I've been asked a number of times what I would do if I had responsibility for hiring a money manager. My response has always been the same. I would go through the procedure that a company uses in selecting a law firm, a medical clinic, or accountants. Find an organization of quality people with integrity, experience, and dedication that is respected by its clients. When you've identified all the money management organizations that meet those specifications, hire the one that has had the worst investment performance over the past two or three years. The recent list of, quote, losers probably represents a very good place to go looking for a money manager. Um, does, does this sink in at all? Does this make any sense to you at all? Does this sound like it should make sense? Um, as you experience as an investment manager, what you'll, what you'll go through is periods of performance where you feel like it's so easy, anybody can do it. And then you'll go put through periods where as long as you have your conviction and you stick with your investment philosophy, you'll be challenged. You'll go through uh, challenging periods, periods where you don't look very smart. We went through a, a, about a 12, 12 straight years of outperformance. Every client meeting we had, um, we talked to our clients about how we're not as smart as you think we are. And then the, three years later, we've gone through three consecutive years of underperformance. Unfortunately, we don't have to say that anymore. Now we're saying we hope we're smarter than you think we are. But those, those will go through uh, every career in the investments field. Every, everybody will go through these periods of times. The next uh, bit of information is, I don't know if you've ever heard of Charlie Ellis, but he's kind of a dean of, of investing. Highly regarded uh, a man who has really studied investment, investors uh, over a very long period of time. All different kinds of investors, by the way, different, different styles. And um, this, uh, this slide was actually taken from the Davis Advisors. They run value mutual funds, very successful firm. And they wrote a piece about understanding the short-term underperformance is inevitable. Um, as you can see in the gold box here, the, the quote from Charlie Ellis is, the basic question facing us is whether it's possible for a superior investment manager to underperform. The, um, the assumption widely held is no, and yet if you look at the records, it's not only possible, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. And so if, if you don't get anything else out of this talk today, hopefully it will prepare you for this inevitable uh, occurrence, because it's going to happen. Um, if, you, if you look through, there was a study done that actually reflects investment managers who are ranked in quartiles or deciles. And if you if you look at this, what, what this slide actually does is it takes the investment managers that are, are in the top, um, the top quartile uh, large cap equity managers and on that day, and then it takes their subsequent 10-year record. And what you'll see is, that 96% of those top quartile large cap uh, managers will at some point in the next 10 years be in the bottom half of their universe of managers. 96%. And you can see also 68% will at some point over a three year period be in the bottom quartile. And 35% will actually be in the bottom decile. So there is a preparation um, that is necessary um, there is a, uh, when you go through these periods, there is a real challenge to your conviction. Um, and if you don't have a discipline, if you don't have conviction, if, you, if, if you're not convinced that your approach, which has been utilized for some period of time, is a successful one, um, you're going to have a tendency to change. And guess when you're going to change? Right at the time of greatest uh, pressure and probably at the time where that is getting ready to flip-flop. Okay, that's getting ready to, to occur. I can tell you, and what you'll see in a minute, um, 
is that the late 90s was a period of time for value investors that was highly challenging. And I'll show you that in a minute. But I'll kind of explain a little bit about kind of what we were going through uh, psychologically and emotionally and everything else. The next slide is a little bit about our firm. Um, I am a co-owner. Uh, I have a, one partner. We're each 50% owners of a firm called Foundation Resource Management. Again, that hyperlink there is one that uh, connects you to our website. And we have a little short three-minute video that gives you a history of our firm. Our firm is really not that old. I mean, it started in 1992. But the lineage of that firm goes back over 60 years. Um, the, there is a man who um, actually came to the University of Arkansas in 1947, uh, from the University of Texas, by the way. And uh, uh, his name is Harold Doolin. Harold Doolin was in the original class of CFAs. He is CFA number 16. Uh, how many are there today? Over 100,000, I know that. But uh, he was in the original class. And um, he uh, mentored, uh, he had an incredible track record where he actually had uh, the top performing endowment fund track record during his tenure uh, in, the, in the country. I, uh, or actually, it's one of the, I can't remember exactly, but it was like number three, I think, in the whole country, not the top performing. Um, he mentored a man named Lee Bodenhammer. And Lee Bodenhammer was my mentor. Um, Lee Bodenhammer is the reason why I live in Little Rock, Arkansas. That's, that's where our firm is based. Um, I had worked in Birmingham, as I said, and, and uh, I'm originally from Alabama, and my wife is as well, but we moved in 1989 to have an opportunity to go work with this man who I had a high degree of respect for and was, had the opportunity to work with him for 11 years until he re retired at the end of 2000. Um, I then sold my interest in that company and started over. And, uh, with my partner today, and that was in, uh, at the end of 2001. Um, our firm is small. Um, we, have, we actually have just hired our 11th person. We have 10 people uh, on staff. Six of those are chartered financial analysts. I don't know. Uh, let me see a show of hands. Anybody that is interested in the CFA program? Uh, anybody that doesn't know about the CFA program, that's something that if you're interested in investing, it's something that you strongly need to look at. I, I would strongly recommend it. Um, anyway, uh, I came to work with Lee Bodenhammer in uh, 1989, and um, we had uh, a company called Meridian Management Company, um, and then started over again with Foundation Resource Management in uh, 2001, the very end of it. Our firm has 110 years of investment experience, um, and we have, so we have six investment people, six CFAs, and we have five support people that are administrative support people. Um, and I feel like we work for them because they are the backbone of our company. They're really uh, incredible staff. Um, we also have CPAs on our staff. We're very uh, accounting oriented as well. We have one investment approach. That's value in investing. We're very disciplined in what we do. And as I said, it started with a lineage of going back over 60 years. So um, it's something that we think is very, very important. We've seen uh, over my career and then many years before that, lots of different investment cycles. Those which uh, favor value investing and those which uh, create challenges for value investing. We manage stock, bond, and balance portfolios. You can see the types of clients we have, insurance companies, charitable foundations, hospitals, retirement plans, and um, high net worth families. Um, and we have about $2 billion under management. Um, so our intention is to grow. You can see kind of our growth. I think it's interesting. This is something I think is really important. Um, we've had people that said, you know, why do you include this? The reason why we include this is our firm has had a, a very successful long-term track record. Um, but we've grown in a very steady fashion. We have seen so many firms in our industry, not just value investors, but all different kinds, that will become hot firms, very popular. And all of a sudden they go from managing $100 million to $10 billion in a very short period of time. That is very hard to manage. Uh, it's, it's extremely hard to manage a business like that. And we've seen many of those firms that have gone from 20 or $30 billion to $3 billion. And that's even harder to manage. So our, our firm, the, the growth that we've had um, is very, very steady and uh, growth that we're 
glad to have. I'm sure we could have done a whole lot better job. But the, our ability to manage the business is one that's um, not, not as challenging as it's some in, uh, in others for other firms. Um, what makes our firm different? Um, as a value investor, what you'll see is um, the conventional approach, and, and actu actually, uh, this may uh, not be real popular in this room, but the conventional approach, academia, is, is uh, in many cases is represented on the left, and our firm is represented on the right. The first is risk. We start with risk. And the traditional measure of risk is the standard deviation of return, volatility of return. Uh, we don't look at risk that way at all. We look at risk as the potential to have a permanent loss of capital. Uh, th the difference between those two, on the right is ours, which is a focus on absolute return, not wanting to lose money. The average person, if you walked up to them on the street and you asked them what's risk, they'd probably say, I don't want to lose my money. That's how we look at risk. But the, by, by long shot, the institutional investment community focuses on volatility. And really the theory is that you can't have higher return without taking a higher degree of risk and having more volatility. Um, we, don't, we don't believe that. The returns uh, category. Uh, the academia, academia tends to focus more on uh, the uh, returns are a function of risk. They're a direct correlation, which I just mentioned. We would say price is everything to determine risk. Um, you can have the greatest company in the world but if you pay a high, too high a price for it, it will not be a good investment. Price dictates return. Um, and so that, that is ingrained in us. Um, the third is markets. The efficient market hypothesis. How many of y'all have heard that term before? Okay. Um, I know it's not popular in universities, but we don't believe in the efficient market hypothesis. Um, our firm believes markets are highly inefficient and that we see volatility every day that are driven by inefficiencies. Fear and greed are the number one determinant of volatility. And it can be intraday or it can be long periods of time. That's something that, is, that is, um, creates tremendous inefficiencies. We've seen securities that were highly mispriced on the upside or the downside. That, that uh, at any given point in time, you know, the investors may have known a lot about that, but they weren't looking long term. And that's what you'll hear in a minute, but that's, that's our focus, is very much long-term investing. And I was talking to, I don't remember his name, from Sanford. Uh, what's your name? James. I was talking to him a little while ago. The, the tremendous disadvantage you students with a student fund have is time horizon. You know, the way you need to look at this from our perspective in managing investments, we're thinking decades. That's what we try to do is focus on decades. Well, you won't be here in decades in decades. And so you're trying, you're planting trees that other people are going to stand under the shade of somewhere down the road. That's hard. Uh, you're put in a lot more of a time box than we are. So you have a, actually a greater disadvantage. Um, it, it makes it much more challenging to do what you all do. So our focus is much more long term. Uh, we also have a different approach as far as, um, I don't know if you all know what the term closet indexing, indexing means, but Generally, what we see is if you looked at a bell curve of the money that's ma actively managed in the world today, a large part of it is what we would call closet indexing. Uh, investors don't want to look stupid on their own, by themselves. Um, they want to be with the herd. Y'all have heard that. that. Years ago, there was an old Merrill Lynch ad about the herd, and you'd see the, the herd running. That is how most investors want to be with the pack. Because, and I'll, I'll talk to you in a minute about this topic, but I'm going to talk to you in a minute about something called career risk. And it is real, and it's tangible, and it affects people every day in our business. But most people don't want to be very far off the index. Because if they are and they're wrong, they're going to get fired. That's what they're worried about. Our viewpoint is we don't care at all about the index. And we don't look anything like the index. And that, frankly, has been a big part of the, our long-term success is because we don't have to be uh, equal weighted in the market in energy stocks or technology stocks. We're not trying to look like an index at all. There are vast areas of, out, of, of overvalued securities and there are large areas of undervalued securities at any given point in time. And our focus is going to be in the latter as far as investment opportunities. 
So we're again focusing on very long-term investing. Our investment philosophy is on the next page. Uh, this is a, a, a kind of a long-winded approach, but the term intrinsic value is a critical term for our firm. Uh, that's what we spend our days doing. Um, we spend probably 85 to 90 percent of our time in research looking at individual securities and trying to determine what we think their intrinsic value of that business is. No different than if you went to the laund laundry uh, on the corner and you wanted to buy that laundromat or if you wanted to buy a particular business, or if you wanted to buy a house in a neighborhood, we'd look at it the same way. What do you think that house is worth? Well, if you were buying a house, what would you look at? What are some of the, the, the variables that you look at? Location. What else? Square footage. That's right. Good. Um, schools, that might be an area, something to look at. Um, uh, how about comparables? Other transactions in the same neighborhood? How, what price per square foot did that go? That's how we look at companies. We're doing our own research, we're trained to do this, and it's very independent. And what we're trying to do is identify what the intrinsic value of that business is and buy that at a discount. Um, and the first place we start is downside risk. Uh, downside trying to protect our clients from losing capital in a permanent fashion. So we don't want to overpay for security. Um, if, you, if you will, let me give you our, our firm's track record. That's, this is on the next page. And the track record actually goes back 23 and a quarter years. And what you'll see is, um, by the way, we've got grant, the, the left-hand column is our client's returns and the right-hand column is the S&P 500 index. And uh, what we've done is we've uh, color-coded the left-hand column. And by the way, let me make sure you understand. Green is good, red is bad. I know y'all know that. But green doesn't necessarily mean positive, and red doesn't necessarily mean negative. It means underperforming the number to the right of it, the S&P 500 index. Everybody follow that? So, for example, you can have a, a green negative number like 2002, or you can have a... Um, a red positive number you can see up there. Well, 23 and a quarter years, you can see on an annualized basis, um, the stock market is compounded a little over 10% a year. And our clients uh, have benefited from a compounding rate of about 15% a year. Um, you all probably are aware of, you've seen growth of a dollar charts. Everybody seen that? How powerful compounding over a long period of time, what a difference it can make. Compounding for 23 and a quarter years, at 10%, 10.32% turns a dollar into about $10. Okay? Over, over at a 15%, at 15.36%, it turns a dollar into $28. So a client would end up with three times the asset base just by compounding at 5% a, a year better than the market. Well, you can see some red on that. Uh, out of 23 and a quarter, there are six red periods, six years where we underperform. Um, and you can see the last three years are half of those. We've been going through that. Um, been a challenging time for finding value for what we do. Um, we're in one of those periods. I, I could not think of a better subject than to really be sitting in front of you and talking about this right now. The only other period of red is the late 1990s. Anybody remember what was going on in the late 1990s? Were y'all born in the late 1990s? <laughs> Enron, the tech bubble. Tech bubble was blowing and blowing and blowing and blowing. If you start in the late 1990s, we've got a little black box around there, that five-year period. Uh, if you'd gone to any of our clients, if we'd gone to our clients, and if they'd hired us at the beginning of 1995, and we'd said, we can get you, we're clairvoyant, we are going to get you 16.24% annualized over the next four, five years, probably every one of our clients would have said, I'll take it, I want it. And guess what happened during that five-year period? The stock market was up 28.54% annualized during that period of time. We saw the highest valuations that we've ever seen in my career and probably the highest other than maybe the Japanese bubble in 1989 in the stock market. So we saw incredible valuations that made no sense to us. Um, and it was a very challenging period of time. Uh, investment managers that were value investors were going through similar kind of uh, phases as we were. And what they were experiencing was outflows of business, 
firings. And what did that cause a lot of them to do? There was a l tremendous pressure on value investors to, be to throw in the towel, to give up on value investing. We saw it every day. If you looked at mutual fund holdings, some of the value funds, and some of them are, were incredibly well regarded. All of a sudden stocks like, and these don't sound like uh, uh, high valuation stocks today, but stocks like Intel, Microsoft, AOL, uh, were starting to show up in value investors' portfolios. Well, why were those showing up? Because they could not face the pressure of losing clients. Uh, and they thought if, if, if we don't do this, the clients are gone. They want some of that 28%. We've got to give it to them. And they abandoned their investment approach. And guess what happens when you do that? In the late 90s, that was going on everywhere. And they abandoned their approach. And their clients got whipsawed because they all of a sudden started owning some of those tech stocks that were selling at 50, 60, 100 times earnings. And uh, it made no sense. Well, if you look at what our firm did, we actually went through 12 straight years of outperformance. Look at 2000, 2001, 2002. The stock market was down 9, down 11, and down 22% on a, on a, uh, uh, over the full period of time. On a cumulative basis, the stock market was down over 40%. Terrible bear market. Not many bear markets rank. I mean, we, the, the, uh, the one back in, in 2008 and early 2009 uh, was even greater than that, over, but it was over a briefer period of time. Uh, our clients, because we did not give in to our, the pressure to change, were up the first two years and down half as much the, the, the third year. And then you can see as the market started recovering, uh, our, our results picked up significantly. Well, look at the red at the bottom. What's going on? Uh, we're finding a great challenge in investing today. In fact, our last quarterly commentary, and by the way, we have, I think we've got a, uh, a hyperlink to our, uh, on our website, our firm has our quarterly commentaries. I encourage you to, to uh, you, you know, that, that's free, <laughs> free of charge. You can read what we're doing and why we're doing it. Actually, I take that back. You can't read everything we're doing. The one difference on, online versus what our clients get, our clients get exactly what you read on our, um, on our website, but what they get that you don't get is, the, which is the meat of it, is the individual securities that we're buying and selling. We don't give that away, obviously. That's what they're paying us fees for. But in this last quarterly commentary, one of our quotes was, in today's world, we, we've actually, last year, we sold 11 stocks and we bought three new stocks last year. I, I mentioned this yesterday in the meeting. We probably reviewed about 250 companies last year. We found three that were attractively valued. By the way, we're looking for a hurdle rate of a 15% annualized rate of return. The market has produced, over 100 years, a 10% rate of return. Really, m very much like this 23 and a quarter. The stock market's up somewhere about 9.5%, really, very close to that. Um, but we're looking for a 15% annualized rate of return. Um, that's what we call a margin of safety. We're looking for that incremental rate of return. I don't think it's coincidental that's what we've achieved for our clients, that 15%. That's over all different kinds of markets. But we're looking for that buffer, that, that incremental rate of return. Um, we said in our last quarterly commentary, uh, that we feel like the designated driver at a, at a party. Does that ring a bell, <laughs> anybody? Um, our viewpoint is, is that we're starting to see people really getting a little bit more euphoric. Valuations are expanding. The stock market is up 50% in the last two years. Earnings are up a cumulative 11%. The difference between those two things is valuation. We're getting PE expansion. We would argue that the Federal Reserve is the driver of that. And we, we, we would call that air. That's not fundamentals. That's not based on earnings. That's not based on the success of businesses. That's based on valuation that's coming from the Federal Reserve in, in their policies. How long that goes on, we have no idea. But when we see something like that that doesn't add up, we're not going to go with the flow just because the pull is to go with the flow. We're going we're to really try to focus on, on valuation. Um, by the way, it, we have this little box here about an annual standard deviation. This is why we don't believe in uh, the modern portfolio theory and that, that uh, 
return is, an, is directly correlated to risk. We've had a lower annual standard deviation than the overall market and a roughly a 50 percent higher rate of return than the market. So um, we're kind of living proof that, that you can actually generate higher returns with less variability, less, less risk from that perspective. Now, um, I want to give you an example. We, we're, we're actually, this is our busy season for client meetings. Uh, generally, we have a lot of client meetings after the end of the year where we're reporting uh, returns for the year. This is an example of an actual client of ours. It's a foundation client. W by the way, we don't disclose, disclose our clients' names at all. Confidential confidentiality is critical in our business. Um, what you'll see is that this, this client hired us 17 years ago. You can see November of 96 is the start date. It's about a $34 million portfolio today that we're managing, an equity portfolio. And they started us when? That first red period in the late 90s. Look at the first three years of that client's returns. It wasn't a lot of fun. You know, you started out in the first year, the market was up 33, we were up 20. Second year, the market was up 28, we were up less than 5%. And then the third year, the market was up 21, we were up 7%. It was a challenging period. Our, our, those, that client was probably questioning their sanity of hiring our firm. But we stuck with our discipline. And look what has occurred over a 17-year period. The reason why I really like this chart is, if you go back to that, that, uh, our track record, those two red periods, they started at the beginning and they ended this period at the end. You could not have picked a worse 17-year period in our company's history. So it, it, and we had almost double the return over that period of time. That's what being a patient, long-term investor can reward you with. Now, the, the hard part is, can you keep them as a client? You know, because there's tremendous pressures. There are people out there all the time trying to uh, recruit that client away from you. And uh, fortunately, that this client understands how we operate. Their patience has been vastly rewarded, and they're convinced that, that it, it will continue to be rewarded. But um, again, the growth of a dollar over this period of time uh, at 7.3% annualized over 17 years, a dollar grows to uh, a little over $3, and uh, at 13.65, a dollar grows at, at uh, right at about nine times. So you're talking about basically if we had, if we had indexed that portfolio, that client would not be a $34 million client. They'd be about an $11 or $12 million client. That's the difference in dollars and cents that you can make uh, in, in this business and, and uh, make a real difference for a foundation. The next page is kind of a little fun way of looking at it. We have a hyperlink to a, a quarterly commentary back in the third quarter of 2012 that we wrote about uh, this kind of phenomenon. Who would you hire? You're, you remember that what we talked about hiring high and firing low, Bob Kirby's article? Your job now is you're working for a Fortune 500 company and you, your responsibility is to hire an investment manager. Okay? And all you've got to look at right now is performance. You've got three examples. You're looking, you've got three, this is your beauty contest. You've got three managers walking in here in, in five minutes. And one of them is going to be manager A and their returns over a five-year period is 16.24% annualized. You might recognize those numbers. That was that five-year number in the late 90s. S&P 500 up 28.54 percent. You go, well, that guy's no good. I, you know, get him out of here. Let's let's bring in the next manager. The next manager B uh, will tell you that he man they have an 11-year track record where they managed a 14 percent annualized return, and the stock market went nowhere uh, over that period of time. I'm sorry, 11 years, 11-year period, 14 percent over 11-year period. And you go, wow, that looks pretty good. That manager knows what he's doing. And then you got manager C. And he's got a 23 and a quarter track year track record. And he's outperforming the market by 5% a year annualized over that period of time. Well, he's pretty smart too. You probably throw out manager A and say, I don't want to talk to him. We're going to look at manager B and C. Well, those are the same manager, obviously. Um, it's a, you're looking at different periods of time. 
And so that's why that, that Kirby article we think is so critical. Because the hardest thing in our business to do is get new clients when you're underperforming. The easiest thing to do is get new clients when everybody thinks you're smart and your, your, your recent performance is really solid. So you, you've get, you'll, if you're in this industry, if you're in this business, you're going to go through these kinds of experiences regardless of what kind of manager you are. Now, um, we've also on the next uh, page, I've got a little information that I'll give you about a, a very important term of risk that you've probably not read about in textbooks. This is the difference between real life and, and uh, the, the textbook world. Most of you all, there are probably dozens of forms of risk that you've probably studied in a, in a great way. There's credit risk, interest rate risk, default risk, price risk, liquidity risk, systematic risk, unsystematic risk. Lots of types of risk. But you probably have never read about career risk. This is real life risk. This in, in our business is the potential to lose your job or lose a client which will cause you to lose a job. Uh, this is reality. Uh, and this is what we were going through in the late 90s. And we're kind of feeling a little bit of it right now. Uh, it is very, very challenging. Um, but it is, it is real. It, it is in the pit of your stomach when you buy a stock, particularly when you've been underperforming. And you think it is a very cheap stock. And frankly, I would say I've never made a great investment decision without feeling it in my gut. Because what we do really doesn't always add up into the real world. The easiest investments to make are usually the worst investments to make. That's, our career has reflected that. Um, the ones that are hard, they're down deep in the pit of your stomach, where you've done the hardest amount of research, many times those are the best investment decisions that you can make. Now they're counter to the culture, they're counter to the investment world, but it, this is reality. And uh, this is what we've experienced. That doesn't mean every one of them is going to work, but I can tell you that the ones that we've made seven times, eight times, ten times our original investment, many of those are the ones that were the hardest ones for us to invest in psychologically. So you've got to have a discipline. I was never in the military. I have great respect for those who, who have been. In the military, you are, you are trained with live fire because at some point you're going to have bullets going at you. And if you're not trained that way, you're going to stand up and run for the hills and that's going to get you killed. Well, that's what we have to do. We have to prepare for that. And career risk is a really critical component. It, it, it is a reality. Um, my, uh, my last slide is something that we look very strongly at. And these are characteristics of successful value investors. We will tell you that as we have conversations with young people, old people, whoever, generally you can size up a value investor in about a 10 minute conversation. Uh, either people get it and it makes so much sense that it's, 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 it's ridiculously easy or it is one of the hardest things in the world to really understand. Uh, our viewpoint is it's very simple. Uh, these are characteristics that we look for. That are, that are uh, as we interview people, and as we talk to other investors, we're looking at these kind of characteristics. The first one is patience. I've already talked about that. You all have a challenge that's unique that we don't have, uh, but patience is critical. Um, we, oftentimes we'll say it's kind of like uh, planting a garden. You know, if you plant a garden and you go inside and you come back out, you don't dig it up because you don't see a green shoot yet. I mean, it'll never grow. It takes time. And, and that's coming from a, somebody with a 33-year career with a lot of gray hair. It takes time. It's, 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 patience is absolutely required. Um, intellectual curiosity is, is highly important. I, I would be willing to say that probably every one of you all has this. Um, you wouldn't be here on a Saturday. Uh, if you didn't have intellectual curiosity. Um, I will tell you, this may sound elementary, but my very first research project that I remember 
was when I was about 15 years old. And I was going to buy a stereo. Now back then, stereos were this big, okay? The, the speakers were this big, and you had amplifiers and turntables and things that don't exist today. But it was a huge investment for me. I had probably five or six hundred dollars to buy a stereo with. You cannot believe the amount of research I did before I bought a stereo. I did not want to overpay. I wanted the, the most I could get for my money. Um, I had an intellectual curiosity. I read everything I could about stereos. I want to know everything about stereos. That is a, a critical component of value investing. You have a thirst for knowledge. You, you, you can't satisfy yourself. You're always looking for learning more about something. Uh, humility. This is a real critical one. Uh, because Wall Street is full of people many times that if you're, I, I will always say, if you're not humble, you're about to be humbled. Uh, there, the Wall Street is full of people that, that flew too close to the sun, that got caught up in it, uh, and they were either highly successful. Um, but I can tell you in the investments business, uh, you, you are not controlling the markets, and the markets will determine whether you are smart or, or stupid. Uh, the markets are bigger than you are. And it is, it, the, the, the day you think that you're bigger than the market and you can influence the market, you're wrong. The markets can be mispriced, but uh, you haven't been in the business long enough if you're not humble because it is a very humbling business. Highly rewarding, but very humbling. A comfort in being apart from the crowd. I'll give you an example of that. Um, as far as a value investor, uh, when I was, in 1986, I was 27 years old, uh, I was sent to a conference up in Rockford, Illinois. Back then, it, was, it wasn't called the CFA Institute, it was called uh, AIMR, Association of Investment Management Research. That's the predecessor to the CFA Institute. They had a conference back then for senior uh, portfolio managers. And for whatever crazy reason, my boss wanted me to go to this. I was 20. I guess I was 27 years old. It was full of people that looked like me now. And I looked like you then. And um, so I was up there. It was a week-long conference. And there was a man that, uh, one, of the, one of the speakers of this conference was a man named Roger Ibbotson. Does that name? I know Sandy, uh, Shane probably know that name. But Roger Ibbotson and his partner Rex Sinkfield were the... Uh, the authorities on uh, long-term returns for various security classes. And they had, I mean, they had a thick book you had to subscribe to because uh, it had all this information about various asset classes. He taught a course. Before we went, you had to have your work done. And one of the, they had different research projects that uh, you, you, the whole group, there were probably 200 executives there, uh, uh, and I wasn't an executive, by the way, um, that were there. And you had to analyze a company, and in 1986, the company was U.S. Steel. Okay? U.S. Steel, in the, in the mid-80s, uh, U.S. Steel uh, was a very unpopular company, very unpopular investment at that time. And what he did is, I'll never forget, it was a big round room, and the stage was in the middle, down below everybody. So it, just, it was like a cone, and there was a little round ring there in the middle. And he asked for people that would want to sell U.S. Steel and for volunteers, anybody that wanted to come down and present their case. Well, the room was sh full of hands. You know, everybody in the room basically wanted to sell U.S. Steel. And then he said, is there anybody, the, the person that did, did a great job, of, of uh, much like we were seeing yesterday, actually, the presentations of a company. And he asked, for, would anybody be willing to buy the stock? And no hands shot up. And finally, I was kind of the lone person. And I raised my hand and made the case for U.S. Steel. Well, the interesting thing, in the summer of 1986, U.S. Steel had acquired uh, Marathon Oil, and oil prices had plummeted to below $10 a barrel. I think they actually hit it that day. Uh, and it was extremely unpopular to own anything that was related to oil whatsoever. And... Um, I'll never forget at the end of that, he, I think he felt so sorry for me. He, he said, everybody's got to give this guy an uh, ovation because nobody wanted to do that. 
Well, at that point in time, it was, a, it was a very successful investment. It actually wasn't a stock that we owned, our firm owned, but it ended up being a very successful investment from that point. So you've got to be willing to be comfortable being apart from the crowd if you're going to be a successful value investor. You have to have a natural skepticism, a willingness to challenge conventional wisdom. If, if you'd write anything down today, the most important question I've learned in doing research is a two-word question, why now? Okay? If you're doing research, uh, a lot of times if you're reading an article about a company, there is some kind of survivor bias. There's a reason why the press wants to write about a company. Generally, it's because something great's happening. Uh, you know, the press wants to write about the latest greatest. It might be Amazon today, for example, uh, which was on 60 Minutes a few weeks ago, and it's considered you know, going to make retail obsolete. And, uh, they may very well, but their valuations are insanely high. But uh, why now? Why was that report on 60 Minutes? Would it have been on 60 Minutes if they were failing? Probably not. So that question of why now has, has really served me well as an analyst. Um, there tends to be a reason, and it can work the other way too. If it's in the press and there's it's something really bad's going on, you've you got to ask, why now? What's going on with that company? Personal accountability. Um, our track record that you saw earlier is our track record. It has no influence coming from clients. So we are accountable to our clients, good or bad, for our results. Uh, we can't blame it on anybody if we're underperforming. It's our decisions, the decisions we've made. So you've got to own up to it. You've got to, you've got to uh, say that this is us. This is our responsibility and our accountability. Then the last one is one that uh, is uh, maybe obvious, maybe not obvious. It's, you're, we're looking for average to above average intelligence. We've seen people that have what I'd call average intelligence that are phenomenal value investors. We've seen people that are basically rocket scientists that do, will never get it. They don't understand it. Uh, it, is, it is very common sense buying low and selling high. It's very common sense being a value investor. It's very difficult to do psychologically. And that's the reason why I wanted to present kind of these thoughts as far as, as the, real, uh, the, the real life world of a value investor. I was at home last weekend and I was trying to think, okay, how would I want to conclude this talk? And I didn't really know what to say. And so I opened up the Wall Street Journal Weekend Edition. And uh, there is a, a column pretty much every Saturday written by Jason Zweig. He writes a column called The Intelligent Investor, which, by the way, is a Benjamin Graham book and famous book that I would encourage all of all, you all to read. Um, and as I was reading this article, there it was, the conclusion. I thought, this is, this is so perfect. This is just uh, divine inspiration. The whole article, it ended in the la very last sentence of this article, was a value investor who can't withstand pain isn't a value investor at all. So my intention today is to talk to you a little bit about the inevitable periods of underperformance, that pain that's going to come uh, if you're fortunate enough to be in this business, uh, it is a reality. And you, some of you may have already even experienced that in your, uh, in your um, uh, managing of your portfolio. Um, but it is a part of investing. So when you feel it, you feel it in your guts, it's not something that's foreign. It's going to happen to everybody. Everybody's going to experience that. I'm going to stop there and see if there are any questions. That's a great question. There, there are advantages in this business, probably like many businesses, where once you kind of get past um, kind of a critical mass, um, huge advantage in being able to select your own clients, pick your clients. Um, and we go through a process. When, when we're uh, being interviewed, we're doing the interviewing just like they're doing the interview of us. 
we're trying to find that perfect match. Uh, we have something that's unusual. I don't know any other firms that do this. Maybe there are some, but I don't know it. Uh, our contract, which is like virtually all firms, says that a client can terminate us with 30 days notice. We can terminate the client with 30 days notice. But what we ask for is what we call a handshake agreement. It's not a legal agreement. But we want somebody to be able to look us in the eye and say they're going to be with us for at least five years. Because we have done a, a, a lot of work on determining if we can work with that client, if they can be a patient client, the odds of their success, if they're going to be with us for five years, the odds go up exponentially. Um, we are trying to weed out those uh, who are, they, they could be a large institution, but if, if we get the caution flags that are going up, that they're not going to be a long-term investor. They're going to be a Monday morning quarterback. Uh, they're, going to, they're going to question everything you do. That's not the kind of client we want. And uh, we try to avoid those clients if at all possible. Sometimes they can fake you. Sometimes um, you know, they can hire you and think, oh, we're getting the folks that outperform the market by 50%. And then you go through three years and they go, what are you doing? Uh, but we really try our best to uh, eliminate uh, the people that we feel like could be kind of here today and gone tomorrow. <coughs> Very good question. Yes? This is kind of your last nice question. Um, you have obviously up the characteristics of successful value investor. Are the same characteristics that you've been able to pull when you're in the uh, They do. Uh, the, the most important characteristic is patience, as we were just describing. Um, not all, let, me, let me go back and say, not all the time. We have some clients that literally hardly look at their portfolio. They've hired us to do that for them. We have some that are involved. They know everything we're doing. They know why we're doing it. We try to really communicate uh, as effectively as, as we can. We want them to know our thought processes behind a, uh, an investment that we're making. Uh, but we have some clients that just say, look, that's what we hired you for. Do it. I want to go play golf or I want to go... I've I got bigger fish to fry. I'll go do something else. But you, you do what you, you're trained to do. Yes? Do you ever have problems with people looking at what you're going to actually do in terms of cash flow and pricing? And you know, they look at the numbers. I actually, you know, actually like talk to people and my money. Do you ever have problems with clients who like kind of take that to question? Yeah, great, great question also. Um, there, are, there are studies that have been done about activity and performance, by the way. And there is... Uh, an indirect correlation. Generally, those firms who are actively trading, whose time horizons are short, generally have worse performance. So that's the first thing I'd go back to somebody and say, studies would re reflect that, that portfolio turnover is counterproductive to returns. Um, but we do go through those periods. As I mentioned, we only bought three new stocks this last year. We sold 11. The, the derivation of that question uh, and by the way, our portfolio turnover is probably under 20% annualized. Um, we generally are looking for a five-year kind of period of time where we're going to own something for somewhere around five years. Some we've owned many years longer than five years. Um, but the, the derivation of that question it has to do with cash. You all were talking about cash yesterday, which I thought was real interesting. Um, and by the way, for the CIMG folks, we were talking about cash yesterday. I would feel, I feel differently about one of the questions about uh, reflecting performance not with cash. Our track record includes cash. And to me, the reason why I think it should include cash is you've made a decision. You need to, that's the accountability issue that I was talking about. You need to accept, if I have cash and the market's up 33%, if I had 10% cash, I just cost, that cost me 3% in return, 10% times 30%. Um, we get that question a lot about cash. Um, if you sell 11 stocks and you buy three, guess what? You're accumulating cash. We've got our average portfolio right now probably has, I'm going to say 17 or 18 percent cash right now. We generally won't go over about 20 percent cash. The only times we've had uh, a, this kind of level of cash was in uh, generally in late 07, early 08. Um, and if you go back to that, um, that chart of our performance. We were actually outperforming pretty strongly, but our clients were saying, we're selling more stocks than we're buying, there's accumulation of cash, and our clients are going, yeah, but if you had all your money, all our money invested, we'd have done even better, so why aren't you fully invested? 
And guess what happened in late 08? You know, we had the financial crisis. And we didn't have to explain to those people at all why we had cash. Because cash is invaluable when you need it. Uh, when bargains are created, if you don't have cash, you got nothing to work with. And so, and let me, let me give you a, a little uh, 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 mention that in late 08, we wrote an email, letter, email, to our clients. Those same clients that didn't want us to own cash. And then now we're, uh, in 08, uh, it was like Christmas morning to us. And it's psychologically hard. The market was going out every day. It was very painful. But to a value investor, that's Christmas morning. That's what we're trained for, is to be able to find bargains. We were finding bargains everywhere, everywhere we looked in late 08. We wrote our clients. We had, at that time, 140 clients a letter and said, we are finding bargains everywhere. We've never seen valuations in our career like this. If you have excess cash, send it to us. We've never done that in our career. 33 years, I've done it one time. How many clients did we have positive response from? Three. We had three out of 140 that sent us more money. It is, it is psychologically so hard. We actually have just had some clients that have hired us, and we're getting invested. But the challenge, you know, what they have a hard time with is, why am I paying you a fee to own cash? And, you know, I understand those arguments. But what we tell them is, um, when we see bargains, that cash is valuable, and it's more valuable, this sounds self-serving, but it's more valuable in our hands than in their hands. They had it in their hands in 08, and they wouldn't let it go. We wanted it. We couldn't get it uh, from a lot of clients. So we think that's a value. And uh, it created I mean, bargains like we've never seen, and we took advantage of that. We didn't know the market was going to snap back like it did in late 09 and then on. But we, what we knew was our discipline. Bargains are here and they're everywhere. This is when you buy. And that's that pit of the stomach feeling. I'd, I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you. I, we were feeling it when we were buying stocks uh, in late 08 and early 09. We actually, actually had one client that hired us in November of 08. And they hired us in a two-step process. And they gave us two-thirds of their assets. And this was the agreement on the front end. And they were going to give us the other third in March of 2009. We never saw it. They never sent it. So we learned a big lesson there. We feel like if, if we have control of the cash, we can deploy it. If they have it, they may be reluctant to do that. Any other questions? Matt? Yeah, we, we do. We are generalists. We'll invest wherever. We're also all cap. That's a huge advantage for us. So that means that if there are times where large stocks can be very much undervalued, there's times when small stocks can be very much undervalued. Um, and even as small a firm as we are with $2 billion under management, we have limitations of what size company we can own because we don't want to be a controlling shareholder. Um, but what we would tell you is we'll look anywhere, and much like Buffett tells you, we don't feel like we have great expertise in technology. Technology is an interesting industry because most people think of technology as a growth industry. We would almost look at it as the opposite. The obsolescence cycles of technology are so short. Now I will say this, Apple has thrown out all the textbooks on obsolescence cycles. They've hit a grand slam home run year after year after year for about the last 12 years. Think about their products. That is, that's unprecedented. But I would, I would never bet on a company being able to do that. Technology cycles tend to last a year and a half or less. So you can have the greatest product, uh, the greatest service technology-wise, but there are always people trying to compete with you. So we would say technology is a really hard place for us to invest. But I will tell you, the most recent investments we've made have been in technology. We call them old tech as opposed to new tech. We've got a slide that we show our clients right now. Uh, new tech, you've got on the right-hand side, PE ratios, Amazon, over 600 times earnings. You've got um, Facebook, 
infinite PE, no earnings. You've got, you know, you've got stocks like that nobody can get enough of. Uh, high valuation, very sexy. And on the other hand, we're looking at stocks that were the high flyers back in the late 90s. And they've earned incredible sums of money in the last 14 years. They have incredible balance sheets, tremendous R&D, research and development. Uh, they're expensing that, by the way. Uh, great dividends that we're earning, some on 3 or 4%, almost all of them are. That's the kind of opportunity we're looking for, and nobody likes those stocks right now. Uh, so we're, generally we're buying a lot of stocks on the new low list and avoiding stocks on the new high list. And, uh, but technology is the one area that we would say we know we have tremendous limitations there. Um, we have made great returns in technology stocks. In the 90s, probably the biggest investment we made was IBM. And you all, um, IBM was the most unpopular company on the face of the earth back in the 90s. It was a has-been company, and we made nine times our original investment and earned an incredible uh, dividend while we did that. We just sold a very successful investment in technology, Seagate Technologies, uh, and just made about seven times our original investment in the, that stock. But we know what we know, and we know what we don't know. We know we're not going to know cutting-edge technology. One other area, you can tell by the way I'm dressed, fashion. We, fashion is, talk about obsolescence cycles, we'll never, retail is an area we, we really are very careful about because that can change on a dime. We were talking about Target yesterday, and that's more generic, but, you know, specialty retail is for somebody other than us. We're, we're, my wife would laugh at me if I told her that I knew what the cutting edge retail fad was going to be, because I don't. Yes, Andy? Well, for taxable accounts, that latter part, sometimes we're influenced by a low-cost basis, large concentration position. Uh, those won't be included in our composite. Our composite is what we've done. Uh, those are very rare. But it, the first part is very important because, again, this is where we differentiate ourselves from probably 90-plus percent of investment managers. Most investment managers, when you hire them, they want that portfolio, brand new portfolio, look just like the client that's been the 17-year client. Uh, we don't do that. Uh, we are looking for absolute return. And so if, you're, if we're in a period like now where it's challenging for us to find bargains, uh, we have more cash in our brand new client that just hired us last week than our 17-year client. Um, we, again, we're, we invest, and by the way, another real important thing, is we invest our own money the same way. All of our investments are the same as our clients. But by the SEC requirements, we don't ever buy a stock for ourselves personally until after all of our clients have bought. We don't sell personally until after all of our clients have sold. But we are different that way with a brand new client. Today, a brand new client that hires us, we're probably about 54% invested overnight. We're probably about 22 stocks rather than our typical portfolio may have about 35 to 40 stocks. So there, there are about 22 that we think are absolute bargains, not just relative, not a stock that we're about to sell in our other client portfolios. We don't want to buy those that are absolute bargains that we think can generate a 15% annualized return. That is very different. I mean, I'm sure you probably look at more investment managers than we do, but what we hear is most investment managers want client A's return to be identical to client B's. Over time, that is, that is going to happen. That client that hires us today, probably in the next year or 18 months, will look very much like the other client. But we're going to work our way in as the market allows us to. What, what do I think about stock? Screening? Stock yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we do screening, uh, all based on valuations. Uh, 
Some of it is traditional, some of it is non-traditional. Um, we're looking at, we're trying to be open to anything. Uh, it might be the new low list, that's a good place to fish for us. But it might be there's an article in Barron's about some challenge that we might think is a short-term challenge, but Barron's is saying don't touch it, or you know, some, some, uh, some uh, publication. So we're open to anything, any, any source. I will tell you this, um, there's, I don't know of any firms that, that look at a valuation metric that we look at. Uh, they may be out there, I just don't know them. Uh, but uh, you might want to write this down because this is very unique to our firm. What we try to do is look at the return on equity of a company over a long period of time. And hopefully over a period of time, generally it's about a decade, we're trying to normalize that return on equity. Uh, it's a long enough pi period of time where we're trying to look at uh, great business environments and poor business environments for a particular company. Um, we're trying to normalize that return on equity. Okay? And then we'll look at the price to book of that stock today. Okay? Let me give you an example. I live in Arkansas. Okay? What's the biggest company in Arkansas? Walmart. Okay? Um, Walmart, I'm, I'm making these numbers up. Don't hold me to this. Let's say Walmart has a 30, uh, their ROE has been 30% over a decade. You know, give or take, but it's been 30% over, over a long period of time. Now, the price you pay for that equity, uh, their, their return on equity, if, if you have a price to book that is a very high number, let's say if you had to pay six times book value, then you just diluted your potential return, all things being equal. Now, the future doesn't always look like the past, but if the company continues to earn 30% uh, 30, 30 return on equity, but you're paying six times equity, six times book value, you should expect a 5% return. Everybody understand that math? Then you have another company that's a terrible company. You know, hadn't run, returned high return on equities at all. Let's say it's returned a 8% uh, return on equity over long periods of time. But if we pay half a book value for that, we can make a case potentially for a 16% return on our equity. Not the company's equity, our equity. The price we're paying for that equity. So that is something that, that is a metric we look at. I, I, I'm sure there are probably other firms that do that, but, but we, I don't know them that do that. That is common sense to us. It's so simple. Uh, that doesn't mean the future is going to be just like the past. We've got, that's part of our work. We've got to determine that. Uh, but so screening is one area, and um, sometimes... We, we follow about 500, a little over 500 companies closely where we've done research on them. Uh, we've, we've identified an intrinsic value. Uh, we've identified a buy price that we think generally will argue for a 15% annualized return as an investor. If it's, a, if it's a very high quality company, it might be a little lower than 15%. If it's a very marginal company, it, we, we've got to have a higher return uh, on investment uh, that we've got to be able to argue for. Um, but... Uh, that list is, is active. It's, it's not just sitting over there in a closet. Prices are changing, companies are growing, companies are shrinking. So we dust those off and do re-reviews of those, trying to determine, has the intrinsic value changed? Has the buy price changed? What's different about this company? And so we've got this pool of potential investments that we've done work on and we're ready to dust it off at a moment's notice. Now, generally, it's not usually a moment's notice because we're watching. We're keeping up with the difference between the stock price and the, the, what we would consider an intrinsic value. So hopefully that helps kind of give you an idea of, of what we're looking for. It can come from crazy things. I used to tell my wife, I had, a, I had a riding lawnmower. And we had this big area in our backyard. And I told her, I came up with the best investment ideas I've ever come up with sitting on that riding lawnmower. Because your brain goes where somewhere that never goes anywhere else. It is totally unlocked. And all of a sudden, it was, it was a strange thing, but I would come up with some ideas that somewhere were back there, but all of a sudden they moved to the front. It was an odd thing, but uh, uh, you, you, can get, you can get ideas from all sorts of places, even on the back of a lawnmower.
that, that, you know, that's part of the reason why I asked the question yesterday. Somebody was recommending, like, I think it was a 5 or 6 percent position. Uh, and that's the reason why I asked that question. Generally, we work our way in. It would be pure luck if we bought on the bottom. We're typically selling stocks that are being sold. That's where the bargains are being created. There's more selling pressure than buying pressure. So we're, sell we're buying things on sale. Uh, so generally we'll initiate a position. It might be a 1% position, it might be a 3% position, it, but the top end is a 7 generally. Maybe 8% is the top end. Our largest position is about a 7.5% position today. So it is quite common for us to buy in over time. As long as we're doing our research and the intrinsic value has not shrunk, the opportunity gap got bigger if it, the stock went down. That, that, uh, opportunity got bigger. So that's what we're looking for. Um, and that difference between price and value is what we're trying to capitalize on. So we tell our clients, the first thing we're gonna, that's going to happen after we buy a stock, it's going to go down. You know, we try to, first of all, tell them, set a low expectation on the front end. And it's quite common. If we're buying a stock, it's probably going to go down and we're going to buy more of it. Um, and more times than not, that's the right thing to do. Thank you all for letting me be here. I appreciate you being here.